Hello, everybody. Welcome to our uh, webinar on district level strategies to advance equity in career and technical education programs. We'll be getting started in just a minute or two as everyone gets in. Okay, as as we're entering, I'm going to go ahead and ask, there's going to be a poll that comes up onto your screen. It would be great if you would share with us just your role in CTE. This helps us to understand who we have in the audience and, and gear our presentation to that. Again, thank you everybody for joining us. We appreciate you spending your lunch hour, after lunch hour, or before lunch hour with us, depending on which time zone you're in. I also want to let you know that this webinar is live captioned, so you can copy and paste the link that was sent in the chat box and put that in. It will ask you just click register. You do not need to fill in any of the information, but we will have live captioning available for you. We are also going to have the Q&A box um, enabled today, as well as the chat box. So if you have a question for the panelists, you can go ahead and enter that in the Q&A box. If you have a comment or if we're doing a group response, you can feel free to put those uh, answers into the chat box. And if you get confused of which one to do which, um, no worries, we will find it and make sure your questions get answered. So welcome again, RHEL Central uh, is hosting this webinar. RHEL Central is the regional education laboratory that services Colorado, Kansas, Missouri, Nebraska, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Wyoming. And our mission is to make sure that we are using evidence to improve educa the education environment. This particular webinar is a part of our College and Career Readiness Research Alliance um, that is focused on ensuring that all students graduate from high school prepared to enter the workforce and enroll in post-secondary degree or certifications. Uh, specifically, we're looking at post-secondary success and ass assessment. All right, so let's see who is joining us today. If we can share the results. Looks like we have some teachers and some school district leaders, school board members a good level of state uh, administrators and a high level of others. So I'm excited to, to learn who our uh, other population is that is joining us and hope that we can answer some questions for you. I'd like to introduce our presenter. So I'm Annie Butterworth with RHEL Central. I have Mark Broderson here, a senior managing researcher at RHEL Central. Uh, Dr. Lori Simon, superintendent of Rapid City Area Schools. Jolene Konichny from Huron School District and Jan Osborne from Portland Public Schools. So thank you very much for joining us. They're going to take some time this afternoon and share some background about their school districts that they're in and some of the strategies that they have um, been using around equity in CTE programs. Um, but before we get to that, we are going to kind of look at equity and CTE programs across the nation um, and starting with an impact study of CTE on post-secondary outcomes in Nebraska and South Dakota. And I'll turn it over to Mark. Okay, thank you, Annie. <clears throat> uh, so today we're going to uh, talk about equity and CTE, and uh, you know, so why are we talking about this uh, right now? So our interest uh, in ensuring that students have equitable access to career and technical education stems in part from uh, you know current re and recent research showing positive student outcomes associated with CTE participation. So uh, to get this thing started, I'm going to start by reviewing the results of a real central study that was recently published that examined the impact of CTE on post-secondary outcomes of students in Nebraska and South Dakota. So the report can be found on the IES webpage, and I think, and we just dropped a, a link in the chat. Um, resources developed for the report include a 15-page full report, the four-page brief, a one-page snapshot. We also uh, you know, created an infographic that uh, 
provides a you know, brief overview of uh, the study results. And then the appendices provide more details on the study methodology that we use, uh, detailed analysis results, and then uh, the results, uh, the outcomes that we're going to talk about here combine uh, data from Nebraska and South Dakota, but the appendices also include um, the results broken out for those two different states for those who are interested. And if we can go to the next one. So for this study, we examined the impact of being a CT concentrator on students on time high school graduation status, as well as their post-secondary enrollment and award attainment, uh, both two and five years after their expected high school graduation year. Uh, so here, a CT concentrator is defined as a student who earns multiple credits aligned to a specific career field. The study sample included students in Nebraska and South Dakota whose high school graduation year was between 2012-13 uh, and 2016-17. Uh, our CT concentrators were matched with non-CT concentrators based on their eighth grade demographic characteristics and academic achievement. Uh, since for this study, we're characterizing CT as primarily being a high school program, this matching was essential uh, to control for selection bias or factors that might influence whether a student decides to become a CT concentrator or not, as well as factors that might influence their later post-secondary success. Uh, you can see that our final sample included over 110,000 students and that CT concentrators and non-concentrators were statistically similar on uh, the baseline characteristics. Uh, this gives us more confidence that we can attribute any differences between the groups on the study outcomes as being due to their CT concentrator status. So now I'm going to briefly go over the, the study results. All righty. So here you can see that CT concentrators were more likely than non-CT concentrators to graduate from high school on time with a difference of 98 versus 85 percent. And it's important to note that the numbers we're presenting here are, these are this is just the raw percentages. So of all the CT concentrators in our sample, 98 percent of them um, uh, graduated high school on time. When we actually did the impact analysis, uh, the statistical analysis where we included like the baseline characteristics and, and all the controls, um, the analysis is kind of different. It looks at uh, differences in the, the likelihood or percentage uh, likelihood of achieving this outcome. And here we found uh, in the impact analysis that our CT concentrators were actually seven percentage points more likely to graduate on time. And because, because of the controls and stuff, those numbers, the seven percent obviously doesn't add up to the difference between here. It's two different ways of looking at the data. We can go to the next one. So here we see uh, CT concentrators were also more likely to enroll in post-secondary education, uh, both within two years and five years of high school. And uh, there, that enrollment includes seeking uh, some kind of a professional uh, certificate, uh, being in a diploma granting program, or a two or four year institution. Uh, and when we did our impact analysis, we found that our CT concentrators were actually 10 percentage points and eight percentage points more likely to enroll in some kind of post-secondary education at, within uh, two and five years. Um, additional analyses we looked at also found them to be more likely to be enrolled, our CT concentrators to be more likely to be enrolled full-time and to be enrolled at both a two and a four-year institution two years after high school. Uh, at five years after high school, they were more likely to be enrolled in a two-year institution and equally as likely to be enrolled in a four-year institution. We can go to the next slide. Okay, now when we're looking at attaining a post-secondary award within two years and five years, we see that our CTA concentrators uh, were more likely to attain a post-secondary award at both of those points in time. Uh, this includes uh, attaining some kind of a professional certificate, a diploma, like a one-year type of a diploma, an associate's degree, bachelor's degree, or graduate degree. And so in our, in our uh, impact analysis, this translates into our CTA concentrators uh, having a two or three percentage point greater likelihood of attaining any type of award. So at five years post high school, we also looked at the type of post-secondary award students earned uh, as their highest degree or terminal award. Here you can see that our CT concentrators were more likely to earn up to an associate's degree as their highest award, while they're slightly less likely to earn a bachelor's degree or higher. The impact analyses, uh, the CT concentrators were four percentage points more likely to uh, earn up to an associate's degree and one percentage point less likely to earn a bachelor's degree or higher than non-CT concentrators. Um, so taking all the study findings together, we show that CT concentrators have better educational outcomes in the short term and are in par doing slightly better than our non-CT concentrators in the long term. And these findings align with uh, those of several other recent studies that I'm going to uh, you know, go over here next. 
So Arnest and Doherty, similar with our study, have shown that CPE concentrators uh, to be more likely to graduate from high school and have similar or somewhat better post-secondary outcomes than non-CTE concentrators. And unfortunately for our study, we were unable to include a workforce outcomes in our study. It was something we were really hoping to do, and it just was not possible given you know, data infrastructure or whatnot at the time. However, um, these two studies uh, did show that CTE concentrators have similar or better employment rates, and they have higher wages than non-CTE concentrators in both the short and the long term. Uh, and so it's this emerging of uh, evidence of positive impacts of CT participation is why we're here today and why we are working towards supporting um, equitable access for all students. So thank you, and I think I go back to Annie now. Yes, thank you, Mark, very much. Um, and I, we are going to move on and look a little bit deeper into some of these numbers um, and a call for action that has been published from uh, Advanced CTE. So before I do that, I wanna go ahead and pause and remind you if you have any questions, please take a moment to, to post them in the question or the Q&A box so we can answer them. Um, I do see one from Jaren and I think we're going to look at some of those numbers here in a second. So uh, with a growing pool of evidence that participating in CTE results in positive outcomes for students. Um, sorry, let me go back. Uh, it has become increasingly urgent that we ensure all students, regardless of their background and life situations, have had an opportunity uh, and the support needed to participate and succeed in CTE programs. Uh, with that understanding, Advanced CTE put out this vision in March. They put out a call for action for education and workforce systems to come together to build a more cohesive, flexible, and responsive career preparation ecosystem with CTE programs as the bond to pull these established systems together and leverage their greatest assets. This vision pushes a new model of collaboration, learner-centric design and delivery, funding and accountability that create the right incentives and support. The vision document clearly states that only through shared commitment and shared ownership among leaders and practitioners at all levels can we realize the possibility and aspiration of a new career preparation ecosystem that prepares each learner with limited opportun limitless opportunity. Um, so a big call to action. And then they broke it down into five principles that need to be examined, redesigned, um, and some rebuilt. So the first princi principle is that each learner engages in a cohesive, flexible, responsible, responsive career preparation ecosystem. The second one talks about each wel learner feeling welcome and being supported to succeed. The third principle is that uh, support is given so each learner can skillfully navigate their own career journey. And the fourth one is that all learner skills are counted, valued, and portable. And the fifth principle is that uh, they all, every student has access to CTE without borders. These five principles are built upon a foundational set of foundational commitments or non-negotiables that have to be in place in a community to make these principles happen. So you can see the, the five um, foundational commitments here including continuous improvement and collaboration, action, actionable data, meaningful public-private partnerships, quality programs and instructors, and equity. Um, equity is the one we're going to highly focus on today, but I think you're going to see a lot of these other principles uh, demonstrated through our school districts and the actions that they're taking. So how is equity defined in CTE programs. Equity is defined as all dimensions of equity, including educational, racial, socioeconomic, gender, and geographic, and meeting the needs of each individual learner. So that is the goal of um, achieving equity. And we're pleased today to be joined by school district leaders who will share some ways that their school districts are working to ensure uh, that this equity program programming is happening in their CTE programs. Before we do that, let's look a little bit at the numbers. So here's a breakdown of CTE participants by ethnicity, by gender, uh, special education services, and second language. While the gap on this graph may seem somewhat negligible, 
The impact is compounded when groups of students that have shown the highest need for increased support in the areas of accessing high wage careers and succeeding in post-secondary learning environments are participating less than groups that have tr traditionally been more successful. Uh, this becomes even more pronounced when you look at CTE concentrators. So the very first graph was just CTE participants. When you move into CTE concentrators, which is where most of the impact studies are showing the benefits, you can see that there is a greater decrease in uh, those populations' participation in the program, um, which, is, which is something we'd all like to work towards increasing those participations. So <clears throat> I'm gonna go ahead and put up another poll for you. And just kind of asking you to reflect on where your organization is in its CTE program equity journey. Um, we all know this is a journey. It's not a light switch. It's not a one, one thing to do and then be done. Uh, so you're maybe at the, we have yet to get started or we are getting started. We're well underway. We're working on sustain sustainability or it's here for good and we're confident that it will go nowhere. I mean, it will take us everywhere, but it will not go away. So we'll just uh, go ahead and answer that poll as our leaders talk about their school districts and then we'll look at that poll after that. So I am going to turn it over to Jolene to tell us a little bit about the Huron School District in South Dakota. Good morning, afternoon, depending on where you're at. Um, I am Jolene Knichny with the Huron School District. My title is Director of ESL, CTE, Federal Programs and Accreditation. So I have a mix of positions. Um, I'm supported by a great team of administrators, faculty and staff, along with community partners that allow us to focus on our students. As you can see by the graphic on the screen, we have a very diverse population of our population of 2,807 students, 44% um, of our population is Caucasian, while the rest are um, of other ethnicities. Um, the wonderful thing about our district is our motto is we are Huron. And what that is, is we embrace everyone that comes in and, um, and we, don't, we don't have a lot of the struggles that a lot of other districts have. Um, within this 2,807 students, 920 of them approximately are ESL students. So, next slide, please. Thank you. I think we're going to go to Rapid City and then we'll come back okay. to the rest of, of the districts. So, uh, I'll turn it over to Dr. Simon. Hi, everyone. Good to be with you. Um, just a high level overview of the makeup of our district. We have just under 13,000 students. And you can see the demographics broken down there on the screen, about 66% uh, white. Between the multiracial and the American Indian, about a third of our students um, are Native American. And then much smaller numbers in our Asian Pacific Islander, Black and Latina Latino students. We have about 2000 staff. And we have 23 schools consisting of 15 elementary schools, five middle schools, two comprehensive high schools and one alternative high school. Um, we have about 45% uh, of our students um, considered um, in poverty or qualifying for free and reduced lunch. And then when we look at some of the indicators on our state report card, um, in terms of that CT concentrator status marker, about 54% of our students are considered um, coursework ready. Thank you. And I'll turn it over to Jan Osborne from Portland. Good morning, afternoon. I'm Jan Osborne. I'm the Director of Career and Technical Education and Career Learning at Portland Public Schools in Portland, Oregon. Uh, we're a district that's just a little under 50,000 students. We're the largest school district in Oregon. Uh, we have a number of schools in our system, including 10 high schools. 
um, eight CBOs and one K-12 where we have CTE programming. Uh, we are a very white district and so intentionally really focusing on our students and families of color. And also a focal area is on our students who are experiencing mobility. Um, in 1920, over 26% of our students were experiencing homelessness and really um, moving between our uh, different campuses. And so really trying to focus on how we support them to have um, great experiences, no matter which campus they might be attending. Thank you. Thank you. So um, as you can see, we have a wide range of districts here for every, everybody to uh, connect with and hopefully you'll find some similarities where you're working as well. And let's go ahead and share the results of the poll. And there we go. So we have a, a, a couple people that have yet to begin the journey in their organization, which is a great place to be because there is a lot of opportunities there. There's a lot of people getting started and underway and working on sustainability and a few people that are could be some experts in the room to help us answer, um, you know, provide other uh, input on what's going well because they have it figured out and dialed in in their area. So great job. Let's, we're gonna now go and allow each of these leaders to have a little more time to explain the strategies that they're using and some of the challenges that they have overcome and uh, you know, continue to put those question and answers into, or questions into the chat box or into the Q&A, and we'll be addressing those as we go along. So Jolene, I'll pass it over to you. Okay, so the very unique thing about our district, and I believe we're the only one in South Dakota that does that, um, is we no longer have different um, K-5 elementary buildings within the district. We have moved to attendance centers. So our kindergarten and first grade are in one building, second and third grade in another building, fourth and fifth grade in another building, and then six through eight are at the middle school and nine through 12 are at the high school. What that has done it is it has kind of taken away any social economic status that the um, student might have. And I was just speaking with a teacher this morning at summer school and she said, you know, when I was going to school, I would come back during the weekends and work at a local gas station. And I overheard a realtor talking to someone that was coming into the district. And she, um, the realtor was female and she said, you do not want to live here, here, or here because then your child would have to attend this lower economic school. And so we have taken those barriers out for our students K-5 um, and allowed them to be a whole group. And it has been, this has been probably about four or five years and it has been absolutely phenomenal for our teachers, for our students, for our community. And so that is something that we are very, very proud of and happy that that change um, got made, so. Some of the challenges that we have faced um, in the past years is the general student population of male-female enrollment versus the CTE male-female enrollment um, really trying to get those non-traditional students um, into those career clusters and allow them to be concentrators. Um, we just did a survey last year of our parents and, whoops, oops, sorry. And um, we want to help the parents, students, and community understand our programs a little bit better. And so one of the things that we're going to do is work with a videographer here in town and work with alumni and current students and community members, get some videos put together showcasing various career clusters and start airing them um, on our local new or TV channel, on our Facebook, um, use social media to help promote that. 
a lot of kids are in CTE classes, but they don't realize that they're in a CTE class. So really working on using that vocabulary with our students, um, our parents and our community. Um, another thing that we will be doing is a challenge is trying to create a greater awareness of career opportunities within CTE. Last year was our first year in um, fully implementing Project Lead the Way launch K through five. And so that will help, we believe our students be able to start thinking about different careers and pathways and allow them to think outside of the box. Oh, I never thought about um, doing this or oh, I didn't think girls or I didn't think boys could do this profession. So opening up that thought box and having open communication and exploration time for the students about where they want to go. Um, we will be um, hosting a middle school construction camp next summer, I think. Um, we're currently breaking ground for an addition to our CTE Center um, July 6th. And if that is finished in time for a middle school construction camp, we will start next summer. If not, it'll be the summer of 2023. But that will allow students to get some experience um, so they're maybe not so intimidated by power tools or the building trades class and allow them to start thinking, oh, maybe I can do that. And then in our senior homerooms, um, starting next year in the 21-22, we're going to really fo focus on workforce development for those students and allow them to really dive into the profession and focus on what standards the state has set for um, for digging into that and so it'll be a trial run if it works well we'll um, take it next year to both juniors and seniors and broaden those opportunities for students to use time during the school day to go out and explore different careers and meet with community partners and start building those relationships to strengthen our program. Great, thank you very much. Um, we do have one follow-up question that I wanna ask and I'm gonna put this out to all of the panelists to, just, to share very quickly. Uh, so the question is, in what other ways are you reaching out to parents about the benefits and advantages of CTE? Uh, are you, with uh, consideration of COVID, able to or having live opportunities to share CTE with parents or PTE, PTA meetings? Um, what other ways are you communicating the advantages of CTE to parents? And I'll start. Jan, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, sure. We had some, um, normally they're in person, our eighth grade uh, information nights. Um, and we're there with materials that we have. Um, and we make sure that they are translated and also um, not heavy with text, but more pictographic of CTE opportunities at their feeder high schools. This year, we had a virtual situation for that. Um, not as good as the in-person, but we still got to meet a lot of families and talk about CT in preparation of going into high school. But I think it's a continual conversation with families uh, to understand uh, that CTE it has changed and it's different than it was in the past. And it, it really does expose students to a number of opportunities and pathways. Thank you. Dr. Simon, anything to add about your district's approach to communicating with parents? Sure, thank you. So we take a similar approach in what Jan described beginning at the eighth grade level as um, we bring in students and families to prepare them and give them information about the high school experience in our academy model, which I'll talk about shortly. Um, but then at the high school level to our high schools do a lot of work with parents in different ways. They'll have different college and career fairs. They'll have um, academy information nights where parents have the opportunity to come in and, and talk directly with school staff about our academy model and what those CTE courses look like within the pathways within our model. Great. Jolene, thank you for sharing and kicking off our discussion on parents. And uh, I will turn it over to Dr. Simon to talk a little bit more about Rapid City's approaches. And, and I do want to say I, I 
recognize we have some questions coming in for the Q and A, and uh, we will we will uh, try to address those uh, once we're done with the presentations. So we we will get to them. Okay, so as I get started here, um, the way that we're approaching equity in CTE is to look at it through the lens of equity and access for all students. And that's just going to be embedded within our model, which I'm going to talk about today. So we have five pillars within our current strategic plan and pillar three is all around expanding opportunities for college and career exploration and enrichment again for all students. And so when we think about our key priorities and strategies underneath this pillar, um, it is about graduation expectations aligned with higher education and our local work uh, force development needs, and then really creating a college and career ready culture of high expectations and equitable access and exposure, as well as multiple pathways and opportunities for all students. So we have engaged heavily with our business, our nonprofit and our higher ed community as well as our students themselves to understand the challenges that we face. So challenge number one is that most young adults really lack the career knowledge and career navigation skills. And that just turns into other challenges. And we know from our exit senior survey, which we actually just completed that less than 50% of our seniors reported that their classes prepared them for college and career. And even fewer, about 45%, felt that they received sufficient college and career support in our um, survey that they just completed. We also know from our data that too many young adults drift in and out of post-secondary education and training, and many don't even complete any kind of degree or program. We know from engaging with our local and regional workforce that there is a serious mismatch between the good skilled career jobs that are available and then students that have the right skills and credentials for those jobs. Um, and this hits really all areas of our, our community, everything from healthcare um, to the auto industry, uh, to our construction industry, it really is broad and far reaching. And finally, we know that many youth and young adults have just given up and disengaged and disconnect from both work and learning. So our response is really, again, this very comprehensive approach. And while it's a K-12 approach, I'm gonna focus on what we are doing specifically in grades eight through 12. And so we use the word college very broadly and really look at it being any sort of educational training opportunity beyond high school. So it may involve a credential, a certificate, um, service in the military, a one-year, a two-year, or a four-year degree program. And when we think about college, career, and life ready, we want students to be prepared for some sort of education and training beyond high school. We want them to not only know how to read, write, understand mathematics, science, social studies, we also want to make sure that they have those important 21st century or employability skills that we hear directly from our um, industry partners. Students need to be able to communicate very well orally and in writing. They need problem solvers. They need critical thinkers. We also want to make sure that our students are equipped to navigate a meaningful career as they begin their adult life. And lastly, we want all of our high school students to graduate with a career action plan for the first year beyond high school. And so at the eighth grade level, our, our work really consists of two key components. All eighth graders take a career exploration class in which higher ed, business and industry partners come in and talk with students, engage in Q&A with them. They have the opportunity to listen to career panels and they learn a little bit about our Rapid City High School Career Academies. 
All eighth graders also attend an eighth grade college and career fair that's held every November. This year, due to COVID, we had to do it very differently. And so we put together a virtual college and career fair. But you can see at the bottom of the screen the four areas in which students were able to engage. They listened to pre-taped career panels by many of our business and industry partners. Um, they actually had a chance to engage virtually with those partners. They learned about our high school career academy model, and they also attended specific workshops that were of interest to them. So, after eighth grade, all students go into our freshman academy. And this um, school year was our inaugural freshman class entering our freshman academy. And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. And then from there, each student will matriculate into an academy of their choice. And you see our academies listed there. Um, one is around business entrepreneurship and hospitality computer arts and sciences, construction and technical trades, health services, human services and education, and science and engineering. We're really looking and describing an academy as a small learning uh, community that contains one or more pathways within it. And a pathway is really um, those courses that are offered in an aligned way within that academy that a student does choose. And I'm gonna walk you through our model here shortly. Oops. So beginning at the freshman academy level this year, um, again, was our inaugural year at both of our comprehensive high schools. We do open up this opportunity to any students attending our alternative high school. They um, do so by virtually attending course. Our, our courses or just um, actually spending part of their day within their um, area high school. So of course they take their four core um, classes. They have plenty of opportunity for elective exploration. And then within the academy credits, they take a half credit of a computer applications course that's front loaded so that they have the tech skills that they need to be successful. Um, they take a quarter credit of grad time, and I'll talk about that shortly. And then the other half credit course is freshman seminar. In freshman seminar, um, they learn about our academies, they go on industry tours, they uh, have panels come in and, and talk and interact with them. They learn study skills, test taking skills, other student success skills, and they also um, learn some important digital citizenship skills. Grad time is offered eight times a year, and it is um, through an, an, an advisory um, schedule that's set um, on those days eight times a year. It's really about graduation readiness, advising, and direction that's coming directly directly from our high school counselors and students are working on the content um, eight times a year on an online learning platform at their own pace. So once students go to 10th grade, um, they opt into the academy area of their choice. And so each of our six academies has an introductory course um, with one caveat, and that's our science and engineering academy. Because we are a huge agriculture and natural resources area here out in the Black Hills, we have um, two academy introductory courses, the intro to ag, food and natural resources, and then the intro to science and engineering. Now, if it's not a good fit at the end of 10th grade, a student can decide that in 11th grade, rather than go to a pathway within the academy, they can try out another academy. We're all about providing students choice within this model. 
If it is a good fit, however, then they will decide which pathway within that academy that they want to matriculate into. And I should note that both the academy introductory course and the pathway foundational course are both state certified CTE courses. And so um, by taking these two courses within our state, then they reach that CTE concentrator status. Um, pathway courses really take kids more deep into a specific um, area or specific career areas within that broader academy. And then really the sky is the limit for our seniors. We're really looking at as a capstone experience year or um, an opportunity for, take, for taking something more specialized within that pathway, whether it's more CTE courses, um, attending one of our partnering um, colleges and universities to take dual enrollment. It could be advanced placement. It could be working on specific industry certifications. It could be an opportunity for a, a job um, or a work-based learning ex experience. I talked about our heavy engagement and um, our community has really stepped up to uh, support our academy model. And so every year we track through a dashboard and you see even despite the, the challenges of a COVID year and having to do a lot of virtual engagement, um, our partners really stepped up and still did increase. Um, at the end of this school year, we have 111 business and industry partners that are offering a range of opportunities for students and supporting us in, in a number of ways. As we think about our model, we look at it as really benefiting everybody in our community, certainly beginning with our, our students. We're trying to make our programming more relevant through interdisciplinary project-based learning. We want them to be better prepared for college, career, and life. And we want them to leave us with the confidence for some real world experiences. And at the end of the day, we want them to graduate with a plan for year one. And hopefully they've had enough exposure so that they either know A, what they want to do and explore more beyond high school. Um, and even just as importantly, what they don't want to do. Certainly for the families, um, it's a benefit to them if their students have more opportunity for exploration and exposure in high school, more knowledge, and it helps families make a smart, smarter um, financial investment in those decisions regarding some sort of post-secondary degree beyond high school for their children. Certainly, we see it as a benefit for our employers. At the end of the day, we hope that they are going to be better engaged. There's going to be lots of opportunities to support and mentor students and that they're going to have access to a better prepared workforce, which then in turn benefits our community that will have a better match between skilled workers and all of the careers that exist and jobs that go unfilled, that will have stronger families and neighborhoods through stronger school and community collaboration, as well as workforce development partnerships. And as I close, this last slide, slide just shows that um, our business community really has stepped up to support um, fiscally and in other ways, each one of our academies. So um, we have a fiscal sponsor for each one of our academies and they have made a long-term five-year financial commitment to sponsoring and supporting our work with our students. Thank you so much for sharing. I think this is a great example of you know, building a system from ground up to address the needs that are, are discussed in the uh, CTE Without Limits vision. Uh, I also want to take a moment to pause and talk about one of the questions, actually combine two of the questions that are in the chat box. And Jolene, I'm going to start with you, so you have fair warning. Um, so there's a lot of, there's two questions discussing uh, moderate and complex disabilities, and both talking about A, do you let students with these disabilities participate in the program? And then how do you accommodate them and 
you guys are designing facilities. So what are your facilities look like for that? Um, and then how are you ensuring that that is happening and that those students aren't being overlooked? We um, allow any student to register for any class that they choose. Um, all of our facilities are handicap accessible. Um, we have several students with disabilities that are um, have taken different CTE classes. Um, I, I can't say in my tenure here that we've had any students with disabilities take welding um, or auto, but we would certainly make those accommodations if that was something that they wanted to do. Um, and we would find a way to make it work. Um, as far as any modifications or accommodations of the content, um, they learn all of the information in the classroom right along the rest of their peers. Um, meet any needs of their IEP, any accommodations or modifications of tests. Um, and the same goes for ESL students with um, LAPs, meet those accommodations and modifications. So um, students know that they are um, able to register for any class that they want. We, we do not hold anything. And um, yeah, it's exciting. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Simon, do you have anything to add about uh, students with disabilities and facility access and data ensuring their participation? Um, yes, so again, our model is intended to provide access and equity for all students, and that includes our students with disabilities. And so as we look at our freshman seminar and our academy courses, et cetera, our pathway courses, all of our special education students will matriculate through our model, um, of course, with the appropriate supports and interventions per their individualized education plans. Within our human services and education academy, we do have a life and workplace readiness pathway that is specific for students with moderate to significant cognitive disabilities and really is um, designed to expand their knowledge and skills in the era of areas of social skill development, independent community living, communication, and workplace readiness. And um, our expectation is that students in this pathway will um, participate to the extent possible given their um, individual needs. Great, thank you. Um, and Jan, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to respond and then go right into your presentation. And uh, I do see some question and answers, possibly uh, Dr. Simon for specifically for academies. Maybe you could answer those in the question and answer with the typing. Jan? Sure, um, I would agree with everything um, that Jolene and Dr. Simon just said. Uh, we also are in the process of modernizing our schools, which has really helped us uh, purposely think about students with disabilities and how can they interact in the auto shop and welding shop some examples of comfortably and that we have machines that adjust for them if they need it uh, really being intentional about the design of new spaces uh, we also um, are designing for students who've experienced trauma so what kind of materials do we use inside and what colors do we think about so that their experience inside the building is positive and uh, more accessible for them than some of our older uh, buildings. Um, so those are some ways that we're doing some additional accommodations for students. Thank you. Uh, Portland Public Schools, just a little bit of background. About eight years ago, uh, we had like 19 programs of study and 20 CTE teachers. We started to see the data coming in that CTE concentrators were graduating at much higher rates than our average uh, non-CTE student. And we really started to uh, push uh, developing CTE programs across our high school system. Uh, we had four high schools that had no CTE on their campuses at that time. And now we have um, 71 programs of study, uh, 14 career clusters represented across the district, over 100 CTE teachers uh, at eight of our comprehensive high schools and three of our alternative education high school sites. Uh, we have been working on our theory of action here at Portland Public Schools, uh, really um, creating the vision for what our North Star is. And so we've used this theory of action to reimagine Portland Public Schools over the last couple of years uh, and had hundreds of stakeholder sessions in the community and received thousands of pieces of data to create our uh, Portland Public Schools vision for our graduates. 
our educators and our system um, and what needs to happen to really create equitable opportunities, especially for our Black and Native American students to realize our graduate portrait. Uh, and our vision is a graduate of Portland Public Schools will be a compassionate, critical thinker, able to collaborate and solve problems and be prepared to lead a more socially just world. And this is really our North Star as we move forward with any programming work uh, within CTE and, CTE and PPS. Uh, this is our nine elements of our graduate profile. Uh, when we look at programming, uh, not only do we look at um, the partner that we want to bring in, but also what part of the graduate profile is this hitting? What kind of experience is this creating for our students to be able to move forward towards this graduate profile? Um, and also how will it fit into our equity, our racial equity and social justice work? We also have nine educator essentials. So anyone who works for Portland Public Schools is an educator and we want them to embrace these essentials as they work with our students within our system to help our, embrace our students and really get them to that graduate profile. And then we have our racial equity and social justice lens. Um, and it's a process of looking at programming uh, partners to really ensure uh, that we're making appropriate choices for our students and communities of color. I will put the link in so you can see the actual questioning that we go through when we have that. Um, we go through the process. For example, um, we had Wells Fargo come to us not too long ago and really wanted to work with a business a CTE program. As we put them through our, uh, our lens, we realized that they really have had negative impact on our communities of color uh, with some unethical practices in banking and mortgage lending. Uh, and so when we went to the teacher, we had a very long discussion about how we might be able to uh, work with them. And we talked with the students and they really wanted to have a talk about ethical banking practices. So we went back and talked with Wells Fargo to let them know it was going to be a, a difficult conversation, but one that our students really wanted to have with them about their choices of the whole Wells Fargo system and how it affected uh, communities of color. And then also then targeting down to that particular um, that particular bank and then how that they were affected by the more national implications of, of the decisions of the Wells Fargo banking system. So it really uh, has us take a look at who we're bringing in and putting in front of students and asking the right questions to make sure uh, we're ensuring um, that we're thinking about all of our students when we're bringing in partners to be in front of them. Um, and then one of the other things about our social justice lens, we know uh, that our CT, uh, CTE students of color are not persisting through and completing the program of study as our, as our white students. And more, they're just kind of picking and choosing. And so really having uh, conversations with families as Jolene and Dr. Simon were talking about earlier um, about understanding what CTE is now and to kind of dismantle the distrust of CTE when historically we have tracked uh, students of color into CTE and really understanding the uh, what CTE is now and the opportunities and rigorous experiences that it can provide uh, for all of our students at Portland Public. Uh, this year with COVID, uh, in fact, in March 2020, <laughs> with the shutdown, uh, we started to do a lot of virtual career learning experiences. Uh, Future you to go was what we launched in March of 2020, right after the shutdown. Uh, and these were 45 uh, minute virtual sessions of career presentations. Uh, we partnered with Portland Community College and talked about all the post-secondary opportunities uh, that were there with them, teaching skills like knife skills with a chef, um, informational inter interviews, and we even did industry tours. Uh, it was very successful and uh, we served over 4,000 high school students this year doing Future You To Go on um, one of our asynchronous days when they did not have to be on the computer for live classes. We also created virtual academies, really having deep experiences with industry partners. And these were multiple week sessions uh, uh, where we aligned a lot of career readiness experiences uh, with those professionals and then deeper understanding of the career pathways with, within there, like uh, we had a nursing academy. Uh, these were really uh, successful this year. Students came back each week. Uh, it was very exciting. One of the things we noticed with virtual learning, it's much easier for our industry partners to participate. And so we know moving forward, we will do some sort of version of this. Uh, we also put together um, a college and career readiness experience on PSAT day. 
And we had over 10,000 of our 15,000 high school students participate in career readiness workshops, post-secondary opportunities, uh, and FASBA and, and, and pieces of that. So um, we're, we're really excited what we learned this year from virtual uh, learning as far as career learning and CCR happened. And we will definitely take some pieces forward into the future when we are back in person. And at Portland Public Schools, about three years ago, we developed a career learning data, data system and partnership system called Partner Connect. Uh, what this has done is uh, help, we have over 700 uh, partners in the system. It's really like a warm Rolodex for our high school career coordinators and really gives us an opportunity to make sure that the partners that we're bringing in reflect our students who are in front of us uh, and so that they can see themselves in the future with all these presentations and opportunities that we're doing. It also gives us career learning data, which we hadn't had before. So who is and who is not participating in our career learning experiences? Uh, we're also developing it data for the CTE programs uh, as well. Uh, so this is just from uh, Future You to Go that we had from March to June of last year. And we could look at who participated and really study um, that and see, we see right that our white students participated at much higher rates than our students of color, especially our, our black students and our Latino students. And so we really set up strategies over the summer of how are we going to target uh, community organizations that might support these families, uh, alliance and affinity groups for these students that are happening at the schools and really um, connecting with those advisors and doing social media campaigns to those groups to try to increase the, the, par the participation over this school year. <coughs> we can also um, break it down. This is by grade level of who participated. We can also do it by gender. And this has been really a great piece for us to have um, on the go data, not waiting a year to get it from the state to be able to make some decisions and also make um, change, change direction if something wasn't working correctly. <coughs> Excuse me. And lastly, uh, we've developed a college and career readiness pathways master plan. Uh, this looks very similar to what Dr. Simon's district is doing. Uh, we, we were one of a handful of districts that received a federal Perkins Innovation Grant where we're tr really trying to make more relevant connections between core and CTE by setting up uh, college and career readiness pathways. We also have ninth grade um, communities for our, our ninth grade students, and that is small communities that cohort together so that our teachers are sharing students. And then also giving our teachers planning time to be able to talk about those students, to be able to reach out to those families and really communicate with them about how their ninth graders are doing and then moving them into more focused uh, themed pathways and really starting to focus on multidisciplinary project-based learning uh, throughout our high school system and actually looking at project-based learning through our K-8 system as well. All right. Thank you, Jan, for sharing how you uh, use data. Uh, I think that was a question that had been in there from the beginning. So I, I'm glad uh, you were able to address that. Uh, and also, uh, I saw a question in there about recruiting STEM teachers, and thank you for Jolene and Dr. Simon for answering that question. Um, I know it's hot on everybody's mind. Uh, we are in our last two minutes, and I want to go ahead and talk about, um, is there any special uh, training or professional development opportunities you're offering to CTE teachers? Uh, so that they are able to differentiate instruction, be trauma-informed, be culturally sensitive, um, especially knowing that there's some, you know, CTE has the alternative pathways, so some of those teachers have not gone through education programs uh, right up front, and so I was going to ask if there's any special opportunities or professional development that is provided for educators. Annie, I can jump in really quickly. Um, all of our teachers are um, going through some level of trauma-informed professional development. Um, and so that that is um, just woven into our annual professional development model. Um, some of it is offered virtually. Some of it is um, done in person with with our trainers and our in our district staff, but we're taking a fairly comprehensive approach there. Also, um, in the area of dyslexia, we have all of our teachers every year engage in the next level of really understanding how to support students with dyslexia and other um, 
reading difficulties or, or disabilities. Thank you so much. Jan, do you have a 30 second answer of anything special from your district? Yes, we are doing a focus on culturally sustaining strategies. Uh, we've brought in Dr. Pat Bettina Love and um, others to really help uh, all teachers uh, think about culturally sustaining strategies. And we're also doing um, uh, professional development around virtual uh, bridge visits, but really um, continuous uh, communication with families, positive positive communication about what's your students' uh, aspirations and dreams, not that it's a call to say, hey, your, your kid was acting up in class, but really trying to create that positive interaction between families and teachers. Thank you. Well, thank you to all our presenters today. Uh, we acknowledge at REL, this is a small drop in a very big bucket on equity across education and especially, especially in CTE. Uh, but welcome all your questions and comments. Please reach out if there's anything further we can do. Uh, we do have an Askarel if you want to use Askarel to ask about some research background data. Uh, you can find that online and we will answer those questions for you. So thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon and thank you for joining us today.